Today, our topic is identity and food. When you think about food, what is it? Well, on the one hand, it's any substance that provides the nutrients needed to maintain life and growth when ingested. But it's more than that. Food includes liquids, such as water. But to humans, food is much more than nutrients. First, humans manipulate food. We not only hunt and gather food, we cultivate plants, we raise livestock. We cook food, which softens tough food or reduces toxins. We share food and trade food. We serve and eat food in social settings. We even create objects in which to store food, prepare food, and serve food. Foodways, or food in a social and cultural setting, recognizes that food is more than nutrients. It refers to the ways in which a culture obtains or selects food, distributes food, prepares food, serves food, and eats food. In other words, food in cultural context across media and including more than simply foodstuffs, but food in social context. Humans use food symbolically. For example, bread. It can be considered to be the staff of life. One breaks bread with friends. To some people, bread represents the body of Christ in communion. Or a person with money has a lot of bread. In many cultures, bread is shared by couples as part of the wedding ceremony. Historically, upper classes ate white bread, poor ate dark bread, but today, whole wheat bread is seen to be health conscious. Food is part of a person's self-identity. We can find correlations between what people eat, how others perceive them, and how they characterize themselves. Food is also tied to cultural identity. Foods tied to cultural identity are usually introduced during childhood and are associated with security or with good memories. These foods hold special worth to a person, even if they now eat them only during ethnic holidays or for personal events. What is culture? One definition is the values, beliefs, attitudes, and practices accepted by members of a group or community. Culture is learned through socialization and language acquisition. And cultural membership may be defined by ethnicity, that is, a shared social identity associated with shared behavior patterns, including food habits, dress, language, family structure, and often religion. Foods associated with cultural identity may be used inclusively. I belong to this culture ethnicity, you can see by my food. Or they may be used to mark or maintain group separation. For example, kafir, a derogatory Arabic term for infidel, was used to label some items found in areas that the Arabs colonized, such as Nabi kafir lime, whose leaves are now a staple in the diet of uh, Southeast Asians, or kafir corn, a type of millet. When people from one ethnicity move to an area with different cultural norms, they begin adaptation to the new majority society. They begin acculturation. With any one person, you can see a continuum between traditional practices and adopted customs. Often, first-generation immigrants adopt some majority culture values and practices, but remain emotionally connected to their culture of origin. And food habits are often among the last practices to change. When you do adopt new foods, it's not generally a steady progression. You may be forced to adopt some new foods because you lack the available native ingredients. Or cost or convenience may play a role. Perhaps you can get those ingredients, but they're too far away or they're too expensive. You may adopt tasty food first and you may discard unpopular traditional foods first. However, the foods most associated with ethnic identity are the most resistant to acculturation. 
For example, among northern uh, people in northern Mexico, if you haven't had maize as part of the meal, the meal is incomplete. Or among the Hmong and Chinese, rice. The core and complementary food model states that core foods are those regularly included in the diet, usually on a daily basis. Whereas secondary foods are widely but less frequently eaten, perhaps once a week or more, but not daily. And peripheral foods are eaten only sporadically, and they tend to be characteristic of individual rather than cultural preference. Changes in food behaviors are thought to happen most often with peripheral foods and least often with core foods. Complementary foods may be necessary to make the core foods palatable or nutritious. So the appropriate use of food and behaviors associated with eating is another expression of group membership. For example, different manners were required when lunching with business associates at an expensive restaurant versus when eating in a school cafeteria or when drinking with friends at a bar or when dining with a date. These manners are culturally situated. If you're unfamiliar with the social rules or if you deliberately break the rules, discomfort ensues, if not on your part, on the people you're with. For example, a girlfriend here in America is more likely to expect to receive which of the following when her boyfriend greets her at the door. A sprig of broccoli, a box of chocolates. Which of the following is considered the more appropriate gift to a hostess when you come to dinner? A bottle of wine or a gallon of milk? Food rules extend to what containers are appropriate for serving food. For example, here's a modern day container. It certainly uh, could hold uh, food. It could hold soup very well. It looks nice and shiny and clean. But is it socially okay to serve soup in it? Which utensil is or is not appropriate in American society today for cutting up this meat? this nicely serrated stone tool, or this so-called steak knife? What is appropriate clothing to wear to a picnic outside versus to a formal state dinner? In the reading that you've um, read already, Anne Murcott, The Cultural Significance of Food and Eating, she points out how habits of eating and drinking are invested with significance by the particular culture or subculture to which they belong. In other words, food is a cultural affair. There are definite ideas within a culture about good and bad table manners, right and wrong ways to present dishes, clear understandings about food appropriate to different occasions. So the cultural meanings associated with foods depend on the social context. They're not inherent in the foodstuffs themselves. Murcott reiterated what Douglas said, that what people eat reflects their social identities. To view eating habits as a matter of culture is to understand that they are a product of codes of conduct and the structure of social relationships of the society in which they occur. In your reading for today, Gene Anderson, Me, Myself, and the Others, Food is a Social Marker, he very aptly points out Nothing brings back a place, time, or occasion more powerfully than a scent or taste. I think the only thing that, that approaches that would be the sound of music. To eat the familiar home food is to be at home, at least in the heart, as well as the stomach. Later in the semester, just before Thanksgiving, we'll talk about comfort foods. Your upcoming assignment is on food traditions. Given that food is one of the most important and persistent aspects of tradition and culture, throughout the world, food is used to celebrate holidays, rituals, and family gatherings. And these traditions connect us to our history, our locale, to our identity, and to one another. Your assignment, due in two weeks, is to list special food occasions you celebrate within your family or group, and then detail two of these occasions. 
For example, you might list birthdays. Do you have special foods or special rules about what food is eaten on your birthday? Or in my family, Thanksgiving was the biggest food meal of the year.